everyone. Uh, my name's Lauren Drell. I'm the campaigns editor at Mashable. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? I'm going to assume that everyone can hear me. Um, okay, so I, again, as I said, I'm the campaigns editor at Mashable, so I oversee all of our advertiser-supported custom content. So I do a mix of brainstorming, writing, and editing content and larger um, integrated programs. Uh, for those of you who don't know Mashable, uh, we are a digital and tech news site. Uh, we're based in New York City. We have about 100 employees. And uh, basically, we have several divisions. We have a news team that's always covering uh, you know, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, all the big news with those kinds of companies. And then we also have a features side that focuses a lot on resources and utility. Um, so Facebook launches Timeline. Here are 10 features you need to know about Timeline. Here's how, here are the dimensions you need your cover photo to be, things like that. So a lot of the features sort of piggyback off of the news that we're breaking. Um, slide to the next one. Um, so Mashable's at the forefront of digital culture. We used to be sort of the social media blog, and as social media has really penetrated mainstream society, uh, we've really grown our content coverage. We launched verticals for US and world and for entertainment, and we're really seeing that digital is everywhere, and basically every news story has a digital tech angle, and that's really where Mashable gets involved in the conversation. So uh, we'll report on memes, things like Grumpy Cats and the Harlem Shake, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Some of you might even have made your own Harlem Shake videos. Uh, and really, we're, we're looking to inform and inspire people around the world. And our audience is not necessarily a particular age group or gender or based on a certain location. Our audience is the connected generation. And you guys, as high schoolers, are on the younger, the younger spectrum of it, but as you grow older and are buying all these devices and, and really getting integrated in, in social and digital media, you are part of the connected generation. So immersed in digital culture, sharing, uh, super social, always connected, and uh, a lot of these people tend to also be very brand loyal, uh, which is nice for Mashable because advertisers like working with us. Um, so this is a slide that's in sort of our sales presentations, and the reason I wanted to include it here is because what's exciting is that tech is sort of viewed as this old boys club, and uh, what's interesting about Mashable is that because we don't purport to be a, a tech site, we're really more about digital culture, we have a, nearly a 50-50 gender split. So women are definitely involved. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have been hearing about women in tech, and and the big conversation uh, with Lean In and, and Sheryl Sandberg's new book. So women are very much a big presence here. Um, we skew pretty young, 25 to 34 um, is our, our main age group. And what's also interesting is that uh, we have the largest percentage of an audience, or the largest percentage of our audience has a household income over $100,000. And what that means uh, for us is that Really, this connected generation being socially savvy and in the know about all of these tech trends uh, is sort of correlated with high income and affluence. So tech is, tech is the place to be. It's very exciting. Um, so obviously, we're here to talk about STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. And um, obviously, those uh, those four categories play a lot into what Mashable is covering, um, but for you guys who are in high school and looking to figure out where you're going to go to college and what you're going to do with your lives, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the cool careers that are out there in the STEM fields. Um, because in case you haven't noticed, and this slide got a little, a little messed up here, nerds run the world. Um, tech startups are booming, and uh, hold on one second. I'm, um, so, tech is everywhere, and really, if you want to succeed, you really need to be digitally savvy, even in some of these more traditional old-school jobs. Um, so, I'm going to go through a couple of, of old-school um, sort of careers, and uh, I highlighted some individuals in the space who have startups or have a digital, um, a digital career within these sort of more maybe old-school sounding companies. Um, so General Electric, obviously 
very large old company, um, but their CMO, Beth Comstock, is really into data. And she, part of her job is parsing through data and making sense of data. And GE actually does a fantastic job with uh, data, visual, data visualization. So Beth Comstock, I mean, you gotta know how to sift through the data and parse it out and really figure out where the, the useful nuggets are. And that's a huge part of her job to tell the GE story and to bring more customers to the GE brand. Um, so, as it says up here, Don Draper would uh, would be fired today. It's not it's not just about some woody copywriting, a, a cute slogan, and a, a snazzy billboard. Uh, Behance is an online portfolio for freelance designers, uh, for graphic designers. And um, this guy, Scott Belsky, he's a designer, and he found that a lot of designers would put their work on the internet and it would get stolen and or used without permission and, and without um, an exchange of money. I mean, these designers, their work is obviously worth a lot. Um, so he said when people put their work up on the internet, it often didn't get the proper attribution and credit it deserved. So Behance is a platform where people can showcase the work that they've done and be discovered by people who are looking for these skills. So it's sort of a network where, where brands uh, and companies can connect with designers to help execute their vision in a beautiful way. Um, fashion is, has always really been a very innovative uh, field and uh, they're really, applying a lot of these new technologies. Um, 3D printing is a big one. There are a lot of brands, uh, a lot of fashion designers who are incorporating LED. Um, if you guys watched the Grammys and saw Carrie Underwood's dress with the, the light projections, that's a really exciting frontier for fashion designers. Uh, so this company, Continuum Fashion, uses 3D printing. And uh, one of the founders said, uh, the interesting part about 3D printing is how you can disrupt the way products are made the prototyping method and the production method become the same thing. And something else really cool about 3D printing is that it can be totally customized. I mean, you can do a body scan and then literally print out something that fits you like a glove. Uh, so it has science and tech have really cool implications for fashion. Um, another company uh, that's very cool is 23andMe. Um, so, I'm sure some of you have sort of mapped out your family tree and you can only kind of go back so far before you, you lose track of who your relatives are. So 23andMe is founded by this woman named Anne Wojcicki and she actually, or sorry, Wojcicki, and she's actually married to one of the Google co-founders, Sergey Brin. They're a very smart, uh, smart tech couple. And it's a DNA kit. And when it first started, it was like $1,000 science to really, to amplify your DNA and, and map really who you are is really expensive. Um, they got a round of funding and now it's only $99. So you spit in this little tube and then you send it back and then the lab processes it for about eight weeks. And then you get a report of your relatives, um, any diseases you might be at risk for. Um, I mean, really amazing, amazing breadth of information. And you find a lot about your ancestry and your genealogy, but also your health. And uh, by lowering the price point and making 23andMe more accessible, Wojcicki is hoping to make this really massive database of information in an effort to revolutionize healthcare. Um, her whole thing is that healthcare is very reactive. You get treated when you develop something. So, oh, I have diabetes, now I need insulin. But diabetes is largely preventable. And if you know that you're at risk for certain things, you can take care of yourself in a different way and, and work with doctors to really prevent the disease from coming to you in the first place. So really innovative and exciting stuff. And lastly, um, Quirky is a very cool company. Uh, started by this guy, Ben Kaufman, who is 25 years old. And he started his first company when he was uh, 18. It's called Mophi. And it's one of those phone cases that um, is also an external battery. So you can charge your phone when you're on the go, I'm sure. If, I'm sure a lot of you are using Maps and Facebook and Twitter and your battery runs out pretty quickly. Uh, so the movie is really great for that and so he invented this and he realized that it was really hard to make that come to life and he realized that a lot of the, the products that were on the shelves at Target and Bed Bath and Beyond aren't necessarily the best ideas, they're just the ones that were created by people with the resources and the connections to get their stuff to these stores. So he founded Quirky a couple years ago 
and it is a collaborative invention platform. So people submit ideas and then they get upvoted and then the community votes and says, oh, it should be this color scheme and we should call it this and you vote on everything. And so by the time it's very much based on the whole two heads are better than one model and many heads are even better than two. Um, so sort of plays on this, uh, this crowdfunding trend. It's like we can make the best ideas by working together and collaborating and getting feedback from everyone. Uh, so Ben created this company and they bring three companies to market or three products to market every single week. Every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, they launch a new product. It's a very, very cool company. Um, they're based in New York and a lot of their products are carried um, obviously on Amazon and eBay. Uh, but they also are at Target and Bed Bath and & Beyond and the Container Store and they're also opening their own store soon because they have developed 250 to 300 products at this point so they can fill their own store. So a lot of super innovative people taking old school business models and reinventing them with a tech, tech angle. Um, something else that is very exciting about this industry is that tech jobs are some of the best jobs in the world and they also pay really well. Um, so the reason College Week Live had reached out to me was because I had done an article a little while ago uh, where I, I talked to 10 interesting people in STEM who have very cool jobs that are sort of these more non-traditional jobs. You know, science isn't just being in a windowless lab in a white coat all day. There are some really, really exciting careers out there uh, in every industry for every interest. Um, and interestingly, this was part of a series that was uh, sponsored by the National Security Agency, which is very cool, obviously, government agency. And they're looking to hire young people in tech. And so they came to us and they, they wanted to do a series of, on this theme of STEM and sort of making it cool and proving that it's a really exciting and fun career. So um, I have 10 jobs uh, where I, I spoke to 10 people with very cool jobs, uh, got some quotes from them, talked to them about the skills that they need to excel in their jobs. Uh, so we can jump right in. And if you guys have any questions throughout this, uh, you can type them in and I'll, I'll see them on my, on my screen and I can answer them in real time. Um, so this first one is a music data journalist at The Next Big Sound, which is a music blog. Uh, so this girl, Liv Booley, basically her job is to find out what is blowing up online, like what songs are really making it big, what artists are sort of bubbling under the surface that are about to become mainstream. Uh, so she curates the next big sound chart. So she calls through all of this data from social networks and she figures out um, sort of like the trajectory of like what artists are really gaining buzz online. And she creates these really cool charts every week. Uh, so it's color coded based and it has like Twitter mentions and, and Facebook mentions and all this really cool information. Uh, she uses a lot of Excel, uh, some graphic design, and uh, she uses MySQL. So there's a little bit of, of programming involved in there. Um, so really cool, she knew about the Lumineers like before anyone was really talking about them just because there were little pockets of communities just across the social web who were kind of starting to talk about them. And so they popped up onto her radar because she knew how to cull through the data and find interesting little nuggets. Uh, so she says, I constant, I'm constantly challenged and feel as though I'm part of something groundbreaking. So big data, I'm sure, is something that you have been hearing about um, recently. I mean, it's, it's definitely a big trend. Um, we're creating massive amounts of data every day, and data itself is, is a good that, that companies pay for. I mean, information is really powerful, and so you can do some really interesting things with data. Um, this is Vandy Tompkins, and she drives the NASA Curiosity rover on Mars. That is really cool. I work with a lot of space nerds, and when I when I told them that I was uh, talking to Vandy Tompkins, they sort of freaked out a little bit, because um, obviously Curiosity is taking some really amazing footage and gathering a lot of amazing information and sending it back to Earth, and so uh, it's just a very cool job. Um, obviously, Vandy. You got to know about robotics, uh, computer science, C programming. Um, here she is uh, at NASA headquarters, and she that is with Mars's uh, the Curiosity rover's Earth twin. So they have a model at home on Earth, so they can sort of 
if, if anything's going wrong, wrong, maybe there's like an arm getting stuck on a rock or something, they can come look at the, the earth model and see what might be going on and sort of troubleshoot from there. Um, so there's a lot of problem solving. The curiosity driver doesn't even, doesn't move too much because every like tiny gesture takes a whole lot of effort and, and science and, and precision going into it. Um, she's a very, very cool, cool job. It's very exciting. Um, so 3M is another company that's been around for quite a while. You might think it's, it's sort of corporate, um, but they have a really cool crew of staff scientists. There are about a hundred of them, and some of them are focused on certain areas, and some of them just get to sort of tinker with whatever they want. And uh, Ray Johnson is one of those guys who just gets to play around, really. And he has a chemical engineering background, but he was just sort of like thinking about light bulbs one day and, and had an idea and went to his boss and basically ended up over the course of the next year creating uh, a 3M's LED advanced lighting. And he, had, he said he had no business doing anything in lighting. That was not something that he had a ton of experience in, but um, 3M is super innovative. They create so many products um, and they also I'm not sure how many of you have heard, have heard about um, how Google has that like 15% time to work on a side project and do whatever you want. That was something that was actually pioneered by 3M. They figured we have all these amazing scientists on staff who I'm sure are thinking about interesting things all day, so let's give them some time to really execute on some of these visions. And uh, a lot of these products, a lot of the ideas have ended up becoming products. Post-its are uh, one such product that came out of this 15% time. And, I mean, imagine how useful Post-its are to you now, and even stickies on your computer. I mean, that was inspired by Post-its. So were it not for the 15% time, it's just sort of letting super smart, creative people just play around with things. I mean, we would never have Post-its. Um, Ray holds a ton of patents, which is very cool, and uh, he says that he gets paid to play, which sounds like an ideal job. Um, and he also, I mean, he's worked at 3M since 1980, so he's a lot of experience there, and that's also very rare to stay at a company for that long. Um, but he said that he's always, he's always been able to grow at 3M because he has this STEM training, and he said that you really learn how to learn. Um, and he says uh, you develop the skill set of learning, which makes the process of learning easier, and you can be very adaptable. You can grow older and develop new interests, so having that STEM education really opens doors. And he said a lot of this other staff scientists at 3M are have really intense like hobbies on the side. They might be a ballet dancer or a triathlete or a mountain climber. And uh, and he said that the company really encourages you to go out and explore these new interests because you never know when an idea might strike and then that could be one of 3M's um, next products. Um, so I just got a question in uh, from Sarah Campos. The question is, aren't all of these jobs hard to find? Some of them are. I mean, there are a lot of, a lot of job boards out there. I mean, I am a journalist and I work in tech essentially, so um, you really just gotta gotta look and pay attention. I mean, what what news sites are you reading? What companies are you reading about? There are um, sites like Mashable and also like VentureBeat and TechCrunch. You can learn about early early stage startups that very well might be the next big thing. I mean, Facebook at one point was only five people, uh, and so it's really with this amazing team that they're able to grow. Um, so you definitely, you just, you have to look um, and just keep your ear to the ground. I think networking is a huge, huge part of it. Um, I go to events all the time where I just meet people and I'm totally happy matchable, not looking to go anywhere anytime soon, but just meeting people and hearing what they're doing um, is just one of the best things you can do. Just go talk to people, ask them questions, uh, especially in tech, people are really excited about what they're doing. I mean, especially entrepreneurs. I mean, these are their companies. This is their baby, and it's what they think about all day long. They want to tell people about it. That's one of the reasons, actually, why I went into um, journalism in this field, talking to small business owners and entrepreneurs. As a journalist, a lot of people don't want to talk to you in certain areas of journalism, but in small business and startups and entrepreneurship, these people are so excited. They're so passionate. They love what they do, and they want to spread the word. So, I mean, reach out to people, pick their brain, ask them um, what their path was, what their skills were, what you can be doing. 
Um, and I'll get to in a little bit some things that you can do to sort of um, get in this mindset of, of finding a STEM career a little bit later. So hopefully that will answer your question, Sarah. Um, so, okay, so that's 3M, that's Ray. Um, moving on to the next slide. Uh, so this one is really cool. Uh, so this guy, Shannon Yates, he works for EA, Electronic Arts, uh, the video game company. And he is an environmental scanner. So ha for those of you who have ever played uh, the Tiger Woods PGA Tour game, so they don't just make those backgrounds in some sort of 3D software. There's literally someone who goes out to every golf course all over the world, and it's this guy's job and has been since 2008, and he uses all this software, including um, Maya and Cyclone and Scene, and literally maps the green within six millimeters of accuracy. So he covers the entire surface of the green, gets all the trees. So this is what it, this is, uh, this picture is of Augusta. Like that is what it looks like. And uh, so he's had an amazing job because obviously he gets to travel everywhere, um, seeing some of the world's most beautiful environments. And then he renders them in 3D software and sees them come to life. And then people everywhere can play these games and really feel like they're there. I mean, these graphics are so incredible and they've come such a long way. Uh, so obviously this is, uh, this is a golf game, but EA has games in so many other, other sports. And so there are some really, really cool jobs in the video game sector. And gaming is a huge industry. So that was one of the ones that was definitely most interesting to me. Um, Tumblr, I'm not sure how many of you have a, a Tumblr blog, um, but it's one of the largest blogging platforms in the world. It has over 100 million blogs, and, it, and these people are posting an insane amount of content every single day. Um, so Renee Perrin uh, is one of the product managers, so she sort of helps um, helps to troubleshoot and helps the product team figure out what what uh, features that they should build out. Um, she uses this software called Zendesk, um, which is basically, uh, I mean, people can send in complaints or any issues that they're having. I you know if you are ever in a software and some error thing comes up and you can click to send the report. So those reports actually get to the company and they get to people like Renee who can work with the product team to sort of troubleshoot and figure out what's going wrong and fix the product and make it better. Um, so constantly improving the product. I mean, Tumblr's come an amazingly long way and uh, it's a really beautiful interface, very simple to use, very intuitive and it takes a lot of work to do that. Um, so uh, Renee's one of the people at Tumblr who does that and she uses a software called Atlassian and then she also uh, learns a lot of programming. Um, there are a lot of languages out there. Um, Mashable uses Ruby on Rails and uh, we built our site in HTML5. Um, obviously there are a ton of languages out there and that's another thing I'll get to in a little bit. Uh, there's definitely some steps you can take now to start being very employable at some of these jobs. Um, but Renee says that she's constantly picking up new skills and hopefully new languages and uh, as long as I'm not afraid of taking something else on, there's always something new to do. And that's something that I will say at startups. I mean, you might be hired to work in marketing, but if there's a task that comes up in, or a project and you want to work on it, I mean, the more the merrier. Startups tend to have limited resources and they want people who can sort of be jacks of all trades and, and be nimble and, and work on several different products and uh, projects and really manage their time well. And, uh, and so that's, it's really exciting when you're hired on to do one thing and you can basically dabble in whatever, whatever you'd like. Um, Kelly just sent in a comment, says, I can't believe the amount of different jobs you can have just for majoring in STEM. This is great. I agree. It's very, very exciting. Um, next person. Uh, this one, this guy's very cool. Uh, Dean Oliver is an ESPN statistician. He used to work for the Denver Nuggets. And, I mean, if you're ever watching um, a sports game and, and something happens and then, uh, like, let's say there's a foul and someone goes for, to go take a free throw, and they have all these stats that come up, and it's like, oh, this person shoots 72% when the team is down in the third quarter away. I mean, the stats they come up with are really crazy. So um, obviously, again, data, there's a lot of data out there, and it's all logged in these systems. And you could do some really amazing statistical modeling. Um, so Dean has background in statistical modeling, engineering, and economics. 
Um, and basically, he's paid to know sports stats and to be able to dig up really interesting uh, facts and figures. And he developed uh, certain metrics. His expertise is in basketball, but obviously, I mean, think about how many sports teams there are out there, how many networks are broadcasting all of these uh, sports, sports games, um, even like at the Olympics. I mean, there's so many opportunities for sort of data nerds like this uh, to have a really exciting career. Um, so he says he builds statistical tools to better understand sports, who is good, what tactics work, and how to pull all the pieces together. So basically it's like money ball. I mean, you might think one player is really amazing and they might blow you away when you're just watching them, but if you really dig into the numbers, there might be this sort of dark horse who is super consistent and might not require as high of a salary and is a, a good investment for a team. So some really cool uh, figures in the sports world. Um, Spotify is a music streaming service. Um, I use it, I'm obsessed with it, I love it. And uh, it's a really great way to discover music. So um, they have several tiers. There's a free version, I use a version that's like $9.99 a month and I use it all the time. It's definitely worth it. And uh, so it's really great, it's integrated with Facebook and you can see what all of your friends are listening to. So I've discovered so many bands just by seeing um, like one of my best friends from college and one of my best friends from high school will be listening to the same song and I'm like, oh, well, I'm probably going to like that band because these are my two go-to music people. So it's really exciting. You can see who's listening to what uh, in real time even. And with all of this information, Spotify has been able to build a music recommendation system. So they might say, oh, we've noticed that you're listening to a lot of this. You might want to also listen to this. And um, by doing these like machine learning programs, you can really customize uh, and, and really offer some really amazing and accurate um, suggestions, recommendations. Um, so Eric Bernardsson is a Swedish computer nerd. Uh, he obviously is not very old, it's probably early 30s maybe, and he's been programming for 20 years. Uh, so a lot of these tech guys, especially uh, on the, the programming sort of development side, uh, just sort of started learning programming for fun. Uh, and obviously it's paid off very well for them. It's a very cool career for Eric. Um, we talked about 3D printing a little bit earlier with uh, the fashion, uh, the continuum fashion. Uh, there's a company based in New York called Shapeways. Uh, there's, there are several 3D printing companies. Um, Shapeways is one that we've written about a lot. And uh, I mean, 3D printing is the craziest technology. I mean, it's really hard to wrap your head around and to see these products and to know that they were printed. It's just a very bizarre technology. Um, but so this guy, William Wagner, is um, a materials manager. So Shapeways can print things in stainless steel, in ceramic, in plastic. And so his job is to figure out what can they, what can they build in? Can they print buildings? And uh, this is something I mean, 3D printing's really taken off. A lot of people are uh, really fascinated by it. It's all over the news. And it ha it's really exciting and really, really promising uh, technology. So, and the way it works, just because the term 3D printing can be confusing, it's also called additive manufacturing. And basically, it grinds um, all these materials into almost like a dust. And then it just puts these very, very, very fine layers and just sort of builds it. And you can actually create shapes with 3D printing that you can't manufacture in tradi with traditional techniques. So it's a really, really cool uh, technology. I can't wait to see uh, where it goes in the next, uh, in the coming years. And companies like MakerBot are making, um, they have the replicator and they have personal 3D printers. So you can have one in your home and you can print out uh, like a cup or a phone case. So it's really exciting. It should be a really cool like, 10 years or so in 3D printing. and crazy things are going to happen. Um, so William says, my job is to find new uses for materials and finishes that will bring additive products closer to traditionally manufactured alternatives. This often involves hacking into industrial 3D printers and getting my hands dirty, messing with resins, molten metal, glass, and aerosol coatings. How cool is that? And, and these, uh, the orange and the purple thing there are just, are just 3D printed little tchotchkes. And right now, a lot of things that are 3D printed tend to be rather small. Um, Corky actually has uh, 3D printers in their office and they'll they prototype with 3D printing uh, and they'll print out in, in plastic uh, just to sort of see what these products look like. 
But um, so they tend to be on the smaller side, but as the technology gets cheaper and, and sort of goes more mainstream, uh, we'll be able to print out a lot of larger items. And there, there is talk about printing houses and buildings. It's pretty cool. And, and also mixing materials, which is very exciting. Um, this is a fun one. Uh, Mandy is a designer at Legoland. So, I mean, can you imagine getting paid to play with Legos for a living? It doesn't sound like a very bad job. It doesn't sound like a job. Um, so, Mandy has a background in sculpture and electrical design. She uses a lot of Photoshop, and Rhino is the 3D printing software that she uses. Um, so obviously she's sort of creating these things on her computer and this 3D software and then it comes to life like this, bigger than a kid, and so she gets to see all of these designs that she's come up with be in Lego land and seeing people interact with them and, and really get excited about them. And if she didn't have sort of like architecture or sculpture knowledge, she wouldn't be able to do that. And I mean these uh, sculptures look super lifelike and, and accurate, so it's very, very cool. Um, application of an architecture background. So, um, let me catch up here with my notes. Um, one other one, I know I talked a lot about uh, big data. I also have interviewed uh, this guy named Jer Thorpe, who used to be the data artist in residence at the New York Times. And so, New York Times obviously has been around for a long time. They have a lot of data. And Jer's job is basically just to have fun with that data. I mean, he's done visualizations about the frequency of words in the New York Times. Uh, he did one that shows how an article starts here and then gets shared through social networks, and it's sort of, they call it cascading, um, as it gets shared, and you can just see like the magnitude of the readers growing. It's really wild. Um, and obviously, another cool job in tech would be to create your own company and your own product and become an entrepreneur. Um, a lot of these, a lot of these startup founders have um, like programming and developing experience. Um, and uh, so, and there, there's really no limit. I mean, if you have an idea, you can build it out. I mean, there are some companies. Um, Skillshare is one where these two guys were thinking, oh, it'd be really cool if we could, if you could have this sort of peer-to-peer -peer learning, and they built the site in one day. And now they have a ton of VC funding, super successful, thousands of classes, thousands of sign-ups, and they're teaching people um, new skills every day. And, and those skills range from things like programming to also like how to do wine pairings and creative writing and any sort of workshop you can imagine. So there are a couple of companies like that. Coursera, Skillshare, and General Assembly are all really cool startups that launched in the past four years or so. And uh, General Assembly has, um, has campuses all over the world. And uh, other ones like Skillshare, uh, you can do them online or in person. And uh, basically anything you want to learn, there's someone there to teach you how to do it. And uh, these courses are, are paid, but they're uh, a lot of times they're cheaper than sort of like a college class if you just want to take a quick, I mean if you're still in high school and you just want to take a quick programming class, um, that could definitely be a really useful opportunity for you. Um, and then speaking of college courses, uh, one of those other pieces of content in that STEM series I was telling you about earlier was uh, 10 cool courses in STEM at colleges. So here's a, a list of just 10 of the courses that we included. Uh, so bio-inspired robotics, geoscience modeling, linear spaces and matrix theory, uh, computer science, electro-optics, submarine design, computer-aided design for ecology, immunobiology. I mean, it's really exciting. These classes like this didn't really exist when I was in college, and I'm not even that old. <laughs> so, I mean, colleges are adapting all the time. They're always adding new classes uh, to stay ahead of the curve and to really prepare their students to succeed in this really quickly changing environment and fast paced. So um, I think actually my biggest regret from college would be not taking a computer science class. I mean, I've, I've learned HTML sort of on the job and I went to grad school and, and did a little bit of programming and HTML and CSS there. But I wish I had learned it when I was younger. Um, and so yeah, I think that would be that would be my biggest regret. Um, we have some questions here. Let me jump into these real quick. Um, why are there only a limited number of scholarships for the STEM program? That I don't know. I it really seems like there's a lot more now. There's a big premium being 
placed on STEM and getting kids interested in STEM because these are the jobs of the future. Um, I'm not the person to ask about scholarships, but that's definitely worth some research. I don't know if the folks at College Week Live could help out with that. Um, and Kelly asks, what's the best way to go about finding a STEM job? As I said, I mean, in high school, I, I, companies a lot of times would come to our high school and tell us about what they do anytime there's some, any sort of like career expo. I mean, go, just see what's out there. Um, you can also look at sites like Indeed, um, the Mashable Job Board's also super helpful. Um, also, just if, sign up for LinkedIn if you, if you haven't already, and just look around, like look at, you can search for companies, you can search locations, you can search uh, job tasks. If there's a, certain, a particular field you're interested in, I know when you're in high school it's hard to figure out what you might want to do. I was pre-med my freshman year and then I wanted to be a lawyer and then, so it, it's changed a lot. Um, but just see what's out there. I mean, by the time you guys get out of college, there's, there are going to be entirely new industries uh, that need people to staff them. So. Um, really just to keep your ear to the ground and develop digital literacy now. I mean, if you're not on these, tum if not, you're not on sites like Tumblr and Twitter, I mean, get on there. There's so much to be learned from these sites. Uh, I mean, I used to go directly to news sites to find out what was going on, and now I get everything on Twitter. And actually, my next slide is um, some really interesting um, tweeters who work in tech. So, I mean, you have access to amazing people who are tweeting interesting things. Like you can literally, you know what they're reading and you, you know what they're interested in. Um, Hillary Mason is the chief scientist at Bitly, that's the URL shortener. Um, she has an amazingly cool job. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson is an astrophysicist. Commander Hadfield is in space <laughs> and he's tweeting all the time. Uh, Aaron Levy is the founder of Box. He's based out in San Francisco and he has really, really interesting insights on technology and, uh, and trends and, and what startups he thinks um, really have staying power. Um, so I, I definitely recommend uh, following him and hearing what he has to say. And then uh, Rachel Hout is the Chief Digital Officer of New York City. She's the first person ever in the city to have that position. And she's done some really, really, um, really incredible things. There have been a lot of sort of hackathons uh, in the city of New York. There was recently a contest called Reinvent Payphones. And basically, um, all of the like, traditional payphones have been out on these streets since 1999, and no one really uses them anymore because a lot of people have smartphones. So you don't really need to stop on the street to make a call uh, from a payphone. So Rachel organized this contest where a bunch of designers and, uh, and engineers and hackers created new ideas for how we can reinvent sorry how we can reinvent the payphone and I actually wrote about it on Mashable yesterday um, so if you google reinvent payphones and you'll see some really exciting stuff so cities obviously have a lot of data and there are a lot of really cool apps um, that can be sort of layered on top of the city to make the urban experience really cool and exciting so Rachel's always tweeting really interesting things and, and talking about cool things happening in New York um, uh, do you know anything about the applied bioprocessing engineering class at the University of Maryland? I do not, I'm sorry. Um, I did not write that article, but um, if you just search for that term and Mashable, that article will come up, and I believe it links to uh, like the course catalog, so you should be able to learn more about that. Um, Kelly says, thank you for the Twitter suggestions, of course. I mean, Twitter is also set up uh, so that you can really follow what interests you. So just search for an interest. I mean, if graphic design piques your interest, just search for it, and it'll give you, it'll show all the tweets that talk about graphic design, and then it'll give you a list of people who have graphic design in their bio uh, or who are graphic designers. And so you can really find interesting people, and you can um, really discover people who, you without these technologies, you never would know about Hillary Mason. I mean, and here you can basically know all of her innermost thoughts and, and what she's reading and, and what she's thinking about and what she's, what she's tweeting about, what she's working on at work. Um, she shares a lot of really cool um, data use cases. So um, Twitter, it's, it's not just about like 
Justin Bieber and One Direction and all their fans having these trending topics. There was really a lot of amazing information uh, to be had there. I'm on it all day. I know Twitter and Facebook are blocked at a lot of workplaces. And Mashable, we're on these sites all day long. It's where a lot of our stories come from. Uh, so it's really the best way to sort of keep your keep your ear to the ground and, and know what's going on. And again, Twitter is real time. So that's actually a really great way to look for jobs also. Hashtag jobs. Um, so you do the pound sign and then jobs and search that. There are job listings galore everywhere, all over the country, all over the world. And you can see what's going on. And when you, I mean, obviously you guys are young, you're not looking to enter the workforce uh, anytime soon, but you can figure out what skill, find out what jobs pique your interest, find out what skills you need to even be qualified for those jobs, and really just start arming yourself now. Um, as I said, not doing computer science is like my biggest regret. I wish I had done it. I would love to know how to build a website or an app. Um, and you guys are young enough that you can you can learn that now and be so super employable it's not even funny and as we said before you could also make a lot of money doing this stuff too um that is that's the end of my presentation uh but if you have any questions you can shoot me an email you can tweet at me um i can hang out for a little bit if you guys want to type in any more questions i can answer to the best of my ability um, thank you guys have been a really great audience and I hope uh, this is exciting and enlightening and, and helpful for you. Um, all right, doesn't look like any more questions are coming through. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and end my presentation now. But um, again, thank you so much. You've been an awesome audience. And feel free to reach out with, uh, with any questions. And get on LinkedIn, get on Facebook, get on Twitter, and see what's out there. I mean, start reading, um, start reading the news sites that talk about all these, all these digital trends. And uh, yeah, that should help arm you and help you be super employable. Oh, got another question. Uh, oh, no, John just says thank you. You're very welcome. All right, thank you so much, guys. Have a good day.